Well, welcome to Claremont for our service for Sunday the 16th of May. My name's Gordon Palmer, minister here. As well as myself taking part in the service, Heather Sturgeon will be reading the scriptures to, to us, Miriam Murphy will be leading us in our prayers for others, and it's Anna Weir who's doing the, the signing uh, this week. Here's some words of, from the Apostle Paul speaking in Romans chapter 8. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies to our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may share also in his glory. We want to give glory to God, glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is the theme of our first hymn, Glory Be to God the Father. going to join in prayer and we'll gather up our prayers and the words of the Lord's Prayer. The words that we use for the Lord's Prayer will appear on the screen. Let us pray. Glory, 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 glory. Lord, you cannot be given enough. You cannot be given too much glory for you are way beyond our understanding. You are way beyond what we can express. You are way beyond what we can anticipate. And you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who live in perfect love and community, have yet in grace made yourself known to us. You've come down to us in Jesus, sharing our flesh. You've come to us, Holy Spirit, in the twists and turns, the ups, the downs of everyday life. You've been with us as we've enjoyed the Father's creation, as we've enjoyed the Father's love set upon us. And we thank you for all these gifts, 
for the provision of a fruitful world and for the provision of that salvation that there is in Christ. And how we thank and praise you that that salvation is not simply about forgiving us our sins and letting us off the hook, but includes this wonderful promise about us being sons and daughters of the living God, adopted into the family of God, co-heirs with Christ. What a place to be. What an enormous privilege to have. Glory be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for such a salvation. And yet forgive us, Lord, when we make light of it. Forgive us for the times when we have not made a big deal of it and said it doesn't matter too much or whatever. Times when we've not spoken up and shared our faith because, well, we don't want to be embarrassed or awkward or whatever. And we've made it seem as though your salvation is something of little or no consequence. Forgive us for that. And help us to grasp better the enormity of the worth of being in Christ and co-heirs with Christ. That we might more willingly, we might more enthusiastically, we might more thoroughly put the way of Jesus into our everyday lives. And we ask that in his name and gather up our prayers in his words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of fire and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of yours, now and forever. Amen. The reading today is from the book of James. James chapter 2, reading from verse 14 to verse 26. Faith and Deeds What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodgings to the spies and then sent them off in different directions? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Amen. don't know how widespread counterfeiting was in the time of the New Testament. I mean, there's quite a lot of it around today. I suppose at one time it was kind of um, folks coming to your doors pretending to be meter readers and trying to get access, or um, folks turning up at your door pretending to be genuine bona fide builders who were going to do this, repair that, and made off with enormous amounts of money. And I suppose as other things were invented, like the internet, there were different ways of um, cheating and counterfeiting, and you'd get emails maybe from, um, supposedly from a friend who was stuck in... Uh, 
um, Kazakhstan or somewhere in desperate need of money and needing you to send a couple of hundred pounds so they could get home, or emails, other emails I used to get um, were from folks, apparently someone in Nigeria or somewhere, wanting to give me two million pounds that we were going to share together, and could I send them their bank details so that they could make the transfer? And oh, there were just so many ways, isn't there? And then there are other kind of counterfeiting that goes on, people pretending that a painting was by a famous artist or that this stone is actually a very valuable jewel and so on. And of course, all of these pretends, all of these counterfeits work best if, if they're realistic. You know, if I took a bit of paper and said and wrote on it, this is a 20 pound note and tried to, nobody would be fooled. Similarly, if someone had the greatest advances of, of printing and, and so on and made a whole batch of, of notes, but they were seven-pound notes, then nobody's going to be fooled. The things about a counterfeit is that it has to closely resemble. My total lack of artistic talent means that I couldn't produce something that, that could be a, a genuine Leonardo or a genuine Van Gogh. Although when I've looked at some of, the, some of his paintings, I've thought, maybe I could give Picasso a try. Now, we're in the book of James, and we're in a series that we're doing about testing. Not testing as in you're going to sit an exam to see if you're good enough, but testing in the sense of, is this worthy? Is this real? And whereas these counterfeit examples are um, people trying to trick us trying to trick others, what James is uh, more interested in is testing ourselves. He's wanting us to look and see and that we really are what we claim to be. And again, you can probably think of instances and examples of, of folks not really being all that aware and having a, a false impression of themselves. You know, who told that person that they could sing? Um, this guy who always sort of turns up at these parties and reads out one of his poems, does he not know that his poetry is rubbish, mere doggerel? Who does so-and-so think that they are always giving his opinion? Do they, who told them they were a genius about everything? And widespread in today's society is this kind of misunderstanding about, about being a Christian. Um, the most recent census for which we have results, that's way back in 2011, and that census approximately 60% of the people in the UK said that they were Christians. 60%, that doesn't tie up with the way that the mission of Jesus is going. And so the claim seems to be made very easily about being a Christian. But James is actually asking that question and saying, test it yourselves. You're a Christian. How do you know? And James asks that kind of question not to trick people, but to reassure those who are in Christ, but also to warn and to challenge those who make false professions of faith, those who make easy professions of faith. It's not trying to an exam to catch us out. James is concerned for us, and it's people's eternity that's at stake. You see, if I very easily say, well, yes, of course I'm a Christian, when I'm not a Christian, it means that I'm not likely to take a proper, proper look at Jesus and his message. I don't need to. I'm already a Christian. But James is saying, how do we know? And have we measured that against Christ? We need to put it into practice. Simply getting a letter saying that you're you can go to, to uh, get a vaccination against the coronavirus. You can get the vaccination on such and such a day at such and such a place. That, that in itself is not enough. You have to go and, and, and get it. And it's not enough just to have vague ideas or thoughts about Jesus, but really, am I putting it, making it real, putting it into practice? Now, James he looked, asked us about our response to trials and temptations, and we looked at that a couple of weeks ago about the question of whether our loyalty to Jesus is above and beyond our own personal circumstances. Because if Jesus is Lord, then the key issue is following Him, loving Him, serving Him, even if it's difficult to do so. The second test we looked at last week is about our attitude to Scripture. 
If we love Jesus, we will love His words. We will want to better know what He says to us, what He wants from us, how we can follow more faithfully. When I was many years ago a, a student for nine months in, in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, um, my then girlfriend, Karen, um, wrote to me frequently. Now, suppose I had come back and said, home after nine months, Karen, I really cherished all these letters. Here they are, but none of them were opened. None of them had been read. She might not have been too pleased. I might not have been able to follow this on to the happy position I am in now where she's my wife. Of course I was going to open it. Of course I was going to look at it. And in the same way, if we say we love Jesus, we will want to know, hear from him, and read the Scriptures and what he's saying to us. So there's those two tests in the previous week, our response to trials and suffering, our attitude to Scripture. And this third test that J James gives in the passage that Heather read is about whether we are living out that Christian faith. Is there enough evidence in, in who I am and the way I live to show that I'm Christ's? Christianity is more than a Sunday thing. It's more than words. It's more than ticking a census box. It's more than an occasional religious bits and pieces in your life. It's possible, says James, to possess counterfeit faith. The counterfeit faith quite often looks like the real thing. That's why people get taken in. And it's possible that we're not fooling only friends and family, but fooling our own selves. And so we need to pause and ask, is that me? Is my faith counterfeit? Am I kidding myself on if I think I'm a Christian? And James helps us in this um, passage by giving us two examples of counterfeit faith and then two examples of the real thing. Firstly, in verses 14 to 17, the first counterfeit example is when someone says that they're a Christian, but their deeds don't match up to it. Basically, it's when we do not put our lives where our mouths are. We express sympathy, condolence, but don't actually do anything to help someone. Wishing someone well when we have the wherewithal to help them means nothing at all, verse 14 and verse 16. The words sound okay, but the actions or the lack of actions are really screaming out, I really don't mean that. You're saying, I really, you know, hope that things go well with you. Go in peace, keep warm and well fed. Verse 16. But all the time I'm saying that and only saying that and not helping, the message is, I don't really care very much. Now, in the example that um, James is giving, it's fellow Christians who are in need it's a brother and a sister, or sister, verse 15. And of course, our obligations to help the needy extends much further, which is why we support organizations like Tear Fund, Christian Aid, and, and so on. But our responsibilities are not just to people far away. It can be a lot harder and a lot more challenging to give our effort, our time, our cash, our practical service, Give that to one another. But unless we do so, says James in these verses, our faith is not real. The gospel is not real. We are playing at rather than being church. Now, it's the issue of practical care and being good towards the poor, sharing our goods that James mentions here, following on from what he'd said in the first 13 verses of the chapter about favoritism. But the danger of saying one thing and doing another the danger of mouthing big commitments and not following it up in our deeds takes in a lot more than that. How different would the Church of Scotland be had all of us who had taken vows of membership actually been faithful and committed to these vows? I think we would have quite a different church throughout the nation, were that the case. So if we say, well, yes, I'm a Christian, but don't actually put the teachings and the way of Jesus into practice, don't take up our cross daily and follow, then we are kidding ourselves on. We are being counterfeit and fooling ourselves. 
The second example he gives in verses 18 and 19 is where people think they can pick and choose. He imagines someone saying, verse 18, well, we're different. You're, you're about what we need to believe. You get the books out. You want to understand doctrine. Me, I just get on with helping others. James' point is that words and deeds need to go together. What we believe and how we live have to match up. It's not that there are some Christians who understand things, and then there are some Christians who do things, and then particularly in today's society, we should say some Christians who feel things. It's not that there are three different groups and you take whichever way you like. No, these things all come together. And real faith should be seen. We can't just simply pick and choose. And then contrasting with these two false um, examples, he then gives two examples for, of faith. Firstly, Abraham, verses 20 to 24. Now, Abraham was regarded by many of the New Testament authors as the prime example of a person of faith. He's referred to as our father, verse 21, God's friend, verse 23, showing that Abraham was very highly regarded. An example is given of his being ready to offer Isaac. And that's not simply an illustration of big commitment to do what God asked, but also trust in the promises of God. Abraham had been given the promise that he would be the father of, of many nations. It's a strange promise because he was already an old man and Sarah, his wife, an old woman, and they didn't have any children. But they eventually did have a child, Isaac, born out of time, as it were. And it was going to be through the seed, through Isaac, that this promise was going to be fulfilled. But then God says to Abraham, I want you to go and take Isaac to a place that I tell you, and I want you, you're going to have to sacrifice him to me. You're going to have to kill him. And so the, the challenge for Abraham is not just about killing his own son, which is big enough, but also, you've given me those prom that promise. It didn't seem like it could happen. Miraculously, it did seem to happen, and now you're wanting me to, to cut it off, put an end to it. True faith was being worked out here by Abraham as he believed God. Here was belief and action working together, here was someone who was very much not just saying, I believe, but was prepared to act on it and to trust. Now, for any and all true believers in Christ, there will be things in our lives that we've done, choices we've made, other things that we've not done, and so on, things that do not make any sense except for our being followers of Jesus. All, all true believers will have examples of that. The way that we spend our money, the things that we don't do, the things that we've turned our back on, whatever. Just as Abraham taking Isaac out to sacrifice him on the mount didn't make any sense except God had spoken to him, so there should be things in your lives, things in my life that make absolutely no sense other than we're following Jesus. Uses of our time, our cash, steps towards reconciliation, forgiving others, decisions not to spend on some things, decisions to do something, not to do something we think is disobedient or dishonoring to Jesus. There must be such examples if our faith is not counterfeit, because faith goes into action. And the action that it goes into is not always stuff that makes sense in the eyes of the world, but rather stuff that's putting the Word of God into practice. So there's Ab Abraham in verses uh, 20 to 24, and then in verses 25 and 26, the quite different example of Rahab. She was very different. Abraham was a Jewish man. Rahab's a Gentile woman. 
Abraham had had a long history of following God, of obeying God. Rahab's conversion seems new when she appears in the story. Abraham was a rich and a highly regarded man. Rahab was poor and a prostitute of a despised profession. Very different. And these two very different examples make the same point, that faith is shown in our actions. In Rahab's case, it was the hiding the spies. Well, you've probably heard stories of, seen, seen films or television programs where people have, have hid Jews or escaped prisoners of war from the Nazis, and how the, seen the, how the soldiers coming through the town and searching and sticking bayonets into things, looking for the people who've escaped, and knowing that there's so much at stake. If they get caught, they'll be killed. If they get caught, not only will they be killed, but the people who are sheltering them will be killed. High stakes. And that's what it was for Rahab. She was hiding the spies. If they get caught, they would be killed. And so would she. She had heard about the Lord. She had heard about what the Lord had done for his people. And it was enough to convince her that she wanted to be in the Lord's side. He was her chance. But it was a gamble. The stakes were high. But faith trusts. Faith acts. So forgeries, counterfeits, can be hard to spot. That's the whole point about them. They come in all shapes and sizes, but so too do the people of faith. And James, using Ab Abraham and Rahab as examples, tell us that. Very different. There is no quick, here is my passport to heaven, no quick showing a certificate or something. There's no quick, Christians all look the same. No, the discerning thing, the differentiating thing is lived out faith, fruit-bearing discipleship. It is faith lived out in such a way that it is clear who is your Lord. Ask yourself. Test yourself, says James. Because there's an eternity at stake. It's not just a matter of little consequence. There's an eternity, an eternal difference between those who are in Christ and those who are not. And there is cheap, easy believism is not saving faith. And still the church and society around us is badly infected by cheap, easy believism. But true faith lays hold of Christ, lays hold of the promises of Christ, and seeks to follow Him in all things. And sometimes, well, not sometimes, I do worry when we come to a passage like this and where it takes us, because I worry about the fact that I know that there are some folk in Clermont who have tender consciences and who, when any challenge like this comes along, immediately see their own inconsistencies and faults. But to those who think like that, James' message should actually be the opposite. The, James' message should be confidence-giving. Those who despair about not serving Christ enough, those who are aware of their inconsistencies and faults and who long to be different and better, they, they are already showing that faith is real. And even though you might not be doing enough in your, own eye, in your own eyes, even though there is, with all of us, room for progress, the very act of trusting Jesus, the very act of seeking to put His will into practice in daily life is reason enough to be confident. However, I also know at Claremont, and in some cases I know this a lot better than some folk know that about this about themselves, I know that there are some who too readily are assuming that they must be fine, that no serious checkup is needed, and that all is well. 
It might be because you're a member. It might be because you've been baptized. It might be because you um, have a standing order. It might be because... But these things themselves are not indications and evidence of true faith. These are not the kind of things that Abraham and, and Rahab were displaying. What Abraham and Rahab displayed was a, I'm going to step out, I'm going to live out the promises of God, and I'm going to live them out even when it means putting myself at risk, even when it means um, making sacrifices, even when it means taking on something that maybe I hadn't um, imagined taking on before God spoke to me, whatever. Jesus put it in terms of picking up our cross daily and following Him. Finding out that what you've got is easy believism and not true faith is not something that you should leave until the day of judgment, because then it will be too late. Put together the tests in the series, the, what we've already said about trials and temptations, chapter 1, the love for the Word of God, the second part of chapter 1, an active faith living out day by day, and the tests that we'll come to in the next couple of weeks. Put them together. Or perhaps take that honest and realistic look at vows that you made, those of you who are members, when you joined the church, or the promises that were made by you or on your behalf when you were baptized. And if such a look suggests your faith might not be real in the terms that James describes here, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a first step to saying, what is real faith in Jesus and where do I get it? You see, sometimes people put off going to a GP until it's too late. Oh, I won't bother the doctor. I won't go. I won't go. And then when they do eventually go, they're wishing that they went two months, four months, six months earlier. Well, don't do similar by putting off, taking that honest look at faith. And this GP, Gordon Palmer, is happy to spend time with anyone over these matters. But it doesn't have to be the minister. It doesn't have to be me. It could be any other Christian that can help. I'll give you some advice, some encouragement, something you might look at and read. Because there is nothing, nothing at all in life that will be more important than the question about whether your faith in Jesus is real or counterfeit. the kind of house that you live in, the kind of career that you have, the size of your family and everything else, none of that, if Jesus tells the truth, none of that matters as much as finding out and being sure about whether your faith is real rather than settling for the counterfeit. And that is not said in a spirit of getting at anyone because it's said in the spirit of we long folks to have the real thing. Just as going to the doctor and getting a diagnosis can be the first step towards a healing, so too the recognition that maybe I've been kidding myself on. Maybe I've just been going through the motions. That can be a first step to the healing of finding the eternal life and finding our place and our identity as a son or daughter of the living God. And that we long to be the reality for all of us. Let's pray. Lord James's words, um, not just in this chapter, but in many places of the short letter, quite straight, quite hard hitting, and yet they're not written in a, he wants to get at us so much as he wants to 
help us to be real and be real with God and real with ourselves and real with one another. Lord, give us a hunger for that kind of reality. Amen. And one of the ways in which such a reality is shown is by that hunger that we have for God and that longing we have for God. As the deer pants for the water is our hymn expressing that longing for God. Um, and after we've sung that hymn, there'll be, we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and then Miriam's going to lead us in our prayers for others. I believe in God. The words of this prayer that we're going to pray um, draw from our inspiration from this book from Sam, Samuel Wells, Crafting Prayers for Public Worship, The Art of Intercession, and from several Bible passages. It is a prayer where you can uh, take part quietly, or if you would like, um, when I say, How long, O Lord? You may respond, How long? So we say, How long, O Lord? And together, How long? Let us bring our prayers and petitions to the Lord. O oh Lord, we are hardly out of pandemic on this hemisphere when we hear of trouble and distress elsewhere in the world. Lord, we are thankful, truly thankful, that we are able to come out of our houses and soon visit each other and even hug each other. What a joy! But how long will COVID news rule the TV screens globally? How long, O oh Lord? How long? 
Father, we are glad to live in a democratic country and once more we've had the privilege to participate in casting our votes, to have our vo voice registered in the political landscape. We thank you for that liberty and the joy of being able to do so and we are so glad that many who previously were not able to take part in this process have now been able to do so. We think of the nations who are governed with an iron fist and where young and old have no say if they are not part of the ruling elite. Give freedom to the parts of the world that lack it. We pray for the newly elected leaders of this nation that you will give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of good counsel and inward strength, and above all, of knowledge and true fear of you. We rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Be close to all who live with political disappointment and anxiety at this time. As so many in the electoral, pro electoral process explicitly name their differences, Help us to rediscover those deeper things that we share so that your country is run in a way that will bring you glory and honor. Make this nation a blessing to its inhabitants and to the world. Lord, do not allow further division to broaden the spaces between us, but unite us in mind and heart. In a moment of silence, we lay before you our deepest hopes and fears in regards to the political situation in the country. How long will the nations mutter against you and plot evil in vain? With the words of Habakkuk, we cry, how long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? We bring before you the situation in Israel-Palestine, the escalating violence, brother fighting against brother, one wrongdoing leading to another, one blood deed to an even bloodier revenge. Lord, have mercy. You have encouraged us in the book of Isaiah not to give you peace until Jerusalem will know righteousness and your salvation. Until Jerusalem will be the place of peace it always was meant to be. How long, O oh Lord? How long? Will you hear our prayer and extinguish the flames of anger and hatred and prejudice among us as well as elsewhere? and bring peace through your second coming. You said you will be with us soon, but for us it has been a very long day, a long wandering in a desert without seeing the promised land of peace and joy. How long, O oh Lord, how long? At the same time, we trust in your timing. Our lives are in your hands. The lives of our spouses, siblings, parents, children are in your hands. We honour you and we seek you. Do reveal yourself to us in a new way. Become a light in our hearts that will lead us forward and guide us home. Fulfil your purpose in us, in each one of us, and as us as a community of your believers, the body of Christ, here in East Kilbride. Amen.